Oh, hey, look, I'm finally getting back to one of those things I said I might get back to. Hello world, we're looking at The Uncertain Light at the End, available on Steam for Windows only. It's a follow-up to 2016's The Uncertain Last Quiet Day, and sports a name that's precisely 12.4% less awkward to say out loud. I should also note that since this is a sequel, I will be spoiling some plot points from the previous game. And before we get started properly, my rig couldn't quite handle playing and recording the game at the same time, so the video is only in 30fps this time round. Sorry about that. Story time! And by story time I mean they show another epilepsy warning that you can't pause and can't possibly finish reading before it fades away. Seriously, why bother showing it if you can't even- So, you remember the opening of the first game, the one that said humans had wiped each other out, leaving the robots to move in and build a society for themselves? That one? Well, the opening to Light at the End either retcons that entirely, continues a plot point I completely missed from the original, or the humans know something that Artie from the last game didn't know. Because what really happened, apparently, is that the robots put nanites into the water supply, rendering the humans who drank it comatose, so the robots could just come in and sweep them all up. How there's any conscious humans left in the world I don't know, since there's only so much bottled water you can grab, but okay. They thought about this one too, there's even a line later on stating that a particular human shelter doesn't have nanites in the water supply. Which... why? Did the robots only use one dose? I hope you like Tangents of the Silk, because I fear I'm going to go on a lot of them. So yeah, we've gone from the perspective of one robot living on the fringes, to seeing what it's like for the few human survivors, and we get introduced to two of those savvy nanite spotting humans very quickly. Emily, who we play as, and Park, who's also there. The two of them are scavenging for supplies in a pharmacy, hoping to provide for other humans they've banded together with. It goes well. And it leads to what's either a new mechanic or one that's been given more of a focus from last time, making decisions that have consequences. The claim is even there in the advertising blurb, and it's technically true. What you choose at these points will have an impact, certainly. In fact, there's achievements tied to pursuing prescribed plot pertinent paths in a particular playthrough. You know how some people criticise The Walking Dead because it doesn't let you drive the plot as much as the complainer thinks it should? Think that, but with a little less agency. Might even open the possibility of multiple playthroughs. Which would be a lot more appealing if you could skip cutscenes or lines of dialogue. Which you can't. At all. Great thing to remember when the first batch of footage I recorded turned out to be useless. Not the game's fault though, I just felt like complaining. Now, like last time, the comparison to The Walking Dead is an apt one. The Telltale style is absolutely the template being used here. Wander about, talk to people, grab some items, do some QTEs, etc, etc. There's some additions and improvements, to be fair to the developers. Mind you, it seems like they had the same animation budget here as Telltale did back in 2012. But the jank is something I'll get into later. And it's worth pointing out that this is a game from a smaller development studio who I'm guessing have a smaller budget to work with. Not to mention a different development studio from last time, this one's by New Game Order. Nope, wait, Steam tells me they made the first one too. But that was Common Games. And Light at the End still points to the Common Games YouTube channel. Hang on, did they just rename themselves between projects? And did they really use the developer's name as the publisher of the first game but forget to capitalise one of the words? Yep, okay, enough of that. Where Light at the End strays from the Telltale formula is in the additions. Like I said, the Telltale template is there and being iterated on. First, you have mini-games. Full-screen puzzles to solve, usually in the guise of some piece of technology that's not doing what it's meant to, or simply not doing what you would like it to. The puzzles themselves aren't bad, I think. They're doable, they're challenging without being impossible, and it's not a big stretch for me to imagine some low-level computer interface taking the form of some logic puzzles. Just as well as it did in the first episode. What's new to the franchise this time round is the wrist-mounted holographic watch which lets you look at your inventory, read any notes or replay any voice logs you've picked up, play some arcade mini-games if you find some small robots, and read Emily's diary. Unlike some games that might use a diary or journal to remind the player of their current task, Emily's diary is purely flavour text. Which is fine, most areas are small enough that forgetting your objective isn't going to become a problem in the first place. It's one of those games that ferries you between small areas with no need to backtrack. And that's a fine part to start talking about how the game plays. You move your character around, interact with hotspots via a coin interface, and sometimes turn a flashlight on or off. 
The coin interface will look pretty familiar, but there's been a change made to it. Instead of having to click the hotspot, then click the option you want, you'll need to click the hotspot, then click and drag the mouse in the direction of the option you want to select. This frankly bizarre change in control scheme actually works surprisingly well. I found it easier to hit those targets than I would if I were trying to line the cursor up with the button. Maybe the collision of the cursor to button is a bit more forgiving in this mode, I don't know. Anyway, I felt like kicking back for a while, so I decided to try a controller instead. That way, using the coin interface is simply a matter of hitting a button with zero aiming required. Which worked fine right up until one of the full screen puzzles where I couldn't tell what I was selecting. And then it turned out that every subsequent puzzle had the exact same problem. Thankfully, the game will seamlessly shift from keyboard to mouse whenever you switch, even swapping out the on-screen prompt. So you can play this game with a controller, you're just going to need a mouse handy for those puzzles. Sadly, it's about this time that my opinion on the game started to go downhill. Things were looking up when I started. That monotone voice acting from the first game, which made sense for the story, playing as a robot and all, but got great in after a while, that's been replaced with human sounding but average quality voice acting. And by average I mean both generally fine but inconsistent performances and the fact that sometimes the characters randomly sound like robots for a line or two. How are we supposed to get past that? This is crazy. The incident, the robots, hell, aliens could invade and for the cashiers it'd be business as usual. That's if there's any audio to their dialogue at all. Toward the end, I didn't think I'd ever hear Emily's voice again. She had dialogue, but apparently no audio to go with it. This might be explained by the fact that the title screen displays version 0.54 on it. Generally, games that aren't in early access will want that number to be at least 1.0. And no, this game is not in early access, to be clear. The further I got in, the more things seemed to go wrong. Having the same character appearing twice in the same scene was amusing, if nothing else. Then again, at least there are other characters in this one. Specifically, characters you hear from and speak to regularly. Something I didn't realise when playing the first game is how boring it can be to spend most of your time with one character and one character only. The odd radio transmission or voice log doesn't really fill the void. Especially when that character only speaks in a monotone robot voice. Even in games that don't include a group of recurring NPCs, there's usually going to be other characters around and adding those for a light at the end made it feel a lot less lonely. Shame that some of your companions are so dislikable, but that's on purpose. There's a limited pool of survivors, they aren't all going to be Mr. Rogers. And hey, make the right choices and you might not have to deal with them for very long. Now, while I didn't have much to complain about with the full screen logic puzzles, apart from that controller issue, the regular gameplay does take a logical nosedive too. For example, you're in a small mechanics garage looking for tools. Where's the first place you would look? Why, in the trunk of the car, of course, which is up on a lift. Why wouldn't a mechanic keep his tools in a place he can't easily reach without machinery and power Jesus actual? Or there's an example from much earlier than that. Emily and a fellow survivor go to loot an electronics store. The items are there, hooray, but when you go to leave, the anti-theft alarm goes off and shuts the doors until they pay. Okay, makes sense. A logical obstacle, kinda cute plot tidbit, ties in with a the running theme of humanity disappearing and the machines carrying on without them. Fine. At which point you can rob a vending machine, then play a VR game with your companion to see who gets to keep the can of soda you just stole. Which they could surely get more of by kicking the machine open. And doesn't involve blinding themselves to any robots that might show up and kidnap them. In fairness, it's optional, and I'm pretty sure you can trigger this before the alarm goes off. It just seems completely illogical for it to be available afterwards. VR shenanigans aside, we still need to find a way to pay for all those items or the shop doors won't open. Eventually, we find an employee card, which we can use to get a 10% employee discount, and we can suddenly leave? How? Is it on our tab? If so, they don't explain it very well. There's actually two ways out of this scene, and the other one makes a lot more sense. But it makes you operate a QWERTY keyboard with a mouse. I don't know which one of those is worse, because I'm pretty sure that last one is a war crime. What I'm trying to get across for all my nitpicky ramblings is this. If you're the type of person who likes to nitpick or likes to point out inconsistencies, I think you're going to get too distracted and frustrated to enjoy this game. 
I'm clearly one of those people, which is admittedly a useful quality for a critic to have. Kinda wish I could turn it off once in a while, mind. Overall, it makes this game a tough sell for me, and that's a shame. Because I've seen people talk about how much they enjoyed The Last Quiet Day, and to a certain extent, Light at the End is more of the same, with some added extras and a little more length. The first game took me roughly two and a half hours, this one took me around four. But I've got bad news for those people too. If graphical glitches, audio bugs, or poorly thought through puzzle solutions are likely to ruin your experience, then I can't recommend the sequel to you either. One bit of good news is that you get a discount if you own the original on Steam. I got this for £9.68. Don't know how long that's in place for, it's worth noting anyway. Now, the devs are not blind to these problems. A hotfix came the day after release, swiftly followed by a statement thanking everyone for the feedback they'd received that wasn't caught during the QA phase. You know, this was looking like a classy move before you threw QA under the bus. There's two sides to this, alright? A bug found is not a bug fixed. I know you can't fix everything and you need to prioritise, but don't outright blame QA for something they probably reported months or years before release. Like I said, this game is an incremental improvement on the game that came before. I didn't like the first game that much, and the sequel left me frustrated more than anything else, but I recognise that people who liked the first will probably get a fair bit out of this. If you get it now, you'll need to put up with everything I just described. For what it's worth, the devs have publicly admitted the problems and committed to fixing them. So, if you liked Last Quiet Day, at least keep an eye on Light at the end. There's an obvious joke in there, but this has gone on long enough.